Welcome to the American Intelligence Media. This is Douglas Gabriel and Michael McKibben. Michael, are you ready? I'm ready. To pull back the veil. Let's do it. Because this is scary. So if you are not seated, please sit down. And if you are not ready to have more bashing of members of the British Royal Privy Council, then you should turn this off. Because what we're about to tell you is somewhat scary. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like a Twilight Zone thing. It's hard to friggin' believe. So I'm going to do the backdrop, as I always like to do, having the final word on things, you know? And then Michael's going to tell you the front drop. And the front drop is going to be more bizarre than what we've even told you to this point. I know that it's almost impossible to believe that. And I'm giving a preface. When do I ever give a preface, folks? Very few, if ever, times do I give a preface. And this needs it because the researchers who have been working nonstop to pull up the the research on this literally do not know what to do with it. And so we're going to have a talk today to try to encourage them and give them kind of an outline in which to put this amount of evil into one place, into one person, because it's almost... Unbelievable. But as you know, we always provide you with more than enough adequate indictable information directly from first-hand resources to prove it to you. And then you can try to prove us wrong. The researchers who pass this through us here at uh, American Intelligence Media and Aim for Truth and Betsy's incredible Truth News headlines and Americans for Innovation and a bunch of other groups and the groups that Michael McKibben and Leader of Technology represent. This is the work of all of them, but none of us quite know how to frame this. We've been sitting around trying to just frame it for you because that's usually uh, like one of the jobs of myself and the Conclave. So I'm going to frame the first part. A few months ago, we started demonstrating that the British crown, uh, the United Kingdom, as they call it, kingdom, with the emphasis on the word kingdom and monarchy, the British crown was deeply involved in everything in it that's American, and to the point that you have to wonder what about one third of all of our services in the military and in civil society and everything is all turned over to a group called Serco, and Serco is totally British. And that Urenco, we just demonstrated Urenco, which is a British company, is pretty much in control of at least half of our uranium market right here. And the Queen's Rio Tinto has the uranium. And that's a whole scandal. And then we started looking to the Queen's, what's called the Crown Agents. And basically, they're just a charity standing there receiving money pouring out of America that goes to them and then it doesn't go anywhere else. And then we found out that OPIC, O-P-I-C, is nothing more than a front for giving uh, American-backed loans to basically nonsense, just giving people money. And if you happen to be standing in line, and the Brits are massively standing in line receiving this money, they get lots of it. And then there's the USAID, which also receives this money. And then there's and then you start looking and you find, wait, the Brits are involved with Lockheed Martin. They're involved with all... all they're involved with BAE, British uh, Aerospace Engineering, is it? Br- or British Aerospace, I think that's what yeah, it is. British Aerospace. And then they're involved with their subsidiaries. And then those are actually have huge parts of Boeing. And then you're looking and you're going, but wait, 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 wait. What did we just discover? We just discovered that Circo not only runs most of our data and our, and our uh, bus systems and all the collection systems and the intelligence systems and the uh, airport systems and you name it, they got their finger in it. And they're being sued for $84 billion worth of fraudulent activities coming out of Britain that is in um, Australia and in Canada and other places, New Zealand, where they were doing, and Britain, doing all this service. And then they found it was fraudulent because 65% of it was being done and the other 35% was being ignored. And they were gouging and they had no bid contracts and everything. So they're kind of collapsing at the same time we're researching them and realizing the depth of the octopus hold on the American system. Well, they run the U.S. Patent Office. Oh, gosh, how could I forget that? that. They They run run FEMA Region 9. The number one thing that creates money in America. 
patents and technology. Look at the whole stock market built up on Silicon Valley stolen patents stolen from leader technologies through IBM Eclipse Foundation. And we've explained this to you a number of times before. So when we started looking closer, we start, started to see that the British control was amazing. And then the researchers started digging down and they found out that this led back to a person named Lord Jeffrey Paddy. Sir Jeffrey, Sir Jeffrey Paddy. Excuse me. I, 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 these British titles. Come on, get it right. I, I Thomas. need a title, you know? I need a title <laughs> if I'm going to talk about these you people. Do. I want a title. I'm going to call you Lord. Oh, that's Douglas. right. I do have a title. My title is In the Ass of the Globalist. Because my first name's Thomas Paine, and my last title is In the Ass of the Globalist. So I am truly a pain, and I'm a pain because I don't like it that Sir Jeffrey Paddy went is in the Privy Council, and I got all upset by this, and I myself was researching it. I'm going, no, I got it. Sir Montebank, the Queen's cousin's in on this, and Lord Richard, or Sir Richard Dearlove, and Anth- Sir Anthony Wood, and and look, R- David, David uh, uh, Walker is in it, who controls the Queen's bank, and then the Queen's court's judges in the Privy Council. She's got this all wrapped up. This is beautiful. And then we saw, look at this. You discovered, you particularly, Michael, and some of your team, discovered the golden share of the queen. And when we saw the golden share of the queen, we're going, holy cow, it's true. The queen has her finger in everything. She's got the ultimate veto power. But how does she do it? She runs it through Sir Jeffrey Paddy. And we thought we'd nailed the, one of the evilest dudes on the earth because he also controls Strategic Communications Laboratories, which was the mother company of Cambridge Analytica, which has been controlling elections in 60 nations, 100 elections where they put people in power or took people out of power, and 44 of those were in America. And so Trump gets in trouble for being with their subsidiary through his, um, one of his people, uh, through Cambridge Analytica, And then it kind of crumbles back that we start to see the true mother company, Strategic Communications Laboratory, how corrupt it is, how amazingly connected to Sir Jeffrey Patty it is. And then we're going, oh my gosh, the Queen's Privy Council seems to be, because there's no constitution governing these people, there's nothing controlling them. They have the ultimate control in all aspects. And then we're thinking it can't be any worse. And then one day, one of your researchers... I'll call him James. He doesn't want to be identified, but I still called him James. So he'll know that I know that I'm giving him credit. (laughs) James is a genius. He should be sitting here talking with us right now. And he he discovered that Mitt Romney's son controls the Smartmatic election devices in Utah. And that's probably why Mitt got elected. And then you looked closer, and it wasn't only Smartmatic, it was the Diebold and the Sequoia and the Inter uh, Heart Agent Civic, that, and every single one and of them. Yes, and S, and Dominion. And they all and have the Sequoia. same software, Optech. And that was the genius that you and James and the other researchers put together. And then you made a chart, and now Roger Stone is, is touting that all over. Mil- tens of millions of people have seen that there is one program owned by an evil person in the Privy Council. He runs it. And that just like Jeffrey uh, uh, Jeffrey Patty runs in the influence machine that has also collapsed and gone bankrupt, but basically shuffled into their shell companies and other companies. So Jeffrey Patty didn't get hurt by... Uh, Serco is still going to be fine, even if they go bankrupt. And Jeffrey Patty's Strategic Communications Laboratory, it doesn't matter they go bankrupt because they have all these things you figured out where they go. And we want to know where they're going. You figured out where they're going, where they've been, and where they're going to go even beyond right. that. And all the companies, and you've revealed all of this in so many minor drops uh, and in the drops on Truth News headlines at the bottom where you've brought out the gold, really. And so we thought Jeffrey Patty was it. Because he can control elections. He's behind George Soros's color revolutions. We couldn't figure that out. And we couldn't figure out how George Soros played into this. And then James shows us that this evil other member of the Privy Council unveils someone who's probably maybe five to ten times worse than Jeffrey Patty, who we thought was about the most evil person we'd come across on the planet right next to George Soros. So, folks... 
all of the machines in America run on the same software, and it was created, ran, and is still manipulated by Smartmatic machines, which he owns also, and many other things. goes back to one person, and now I'm going to try to be quiet and let Michael McKibben tell you about this new evil lord that he has uncovered. His name is Lord Mark Malik Brown. And I would say you're probably right. As far as we can tell, he is five to ten times more corrupt than even Sir Jeffrey Patty. And the researchers, as we started digging into his background, we discovered some telltale signs. And one of them was that no two of his resumes that are out there all over the place are the same. Every time a different aspect of his background is is mentioned and there is no compilation and even the UK Parliament has a very incomplete resume. And so our, our people and friends started putting together a biography timeline, which is now pretty much in place. And I think Betsy has it up on Truth News and it shows the resume of 10 men. There's no way one person could have done everything that he claims to have done. But he doesn't claim it in any one resume. But when you put all 10 resumes, all, all, all the various versions of his background together, you see a superhuman being that could not possibly exist on this planet and operate in business without spending every waking moment traveling from one business to another like a bee, pollinating the flowers. And he's been doing that for 20 years, 20 or 30 years. And his his background is he, he came up from all the right places. His wife's uh, father was, a, was a, a knight, and that appears to be how he got his start. And he, he went from one job to another. He very quickly rose to the number two position in the United Nations. And he, his focus was on refugees. And then after he, uh, and he was also involved in U.S. law firms. He was involved with the um, uh, the World Bank, with the um, uh, the Davis Group, uh, World Economic Forum, uh, the um, uh, Council on Foreign Affairs. You name it, he was in it, and he was at the top of it, and he was either chairman or vice chairman or a director. And then he was appointed to the British Parliament. He was a minister um, of uh, equivalent to what Sir Geoffrey was, uh, minister of trade, uh, but it was a slightly different name. And then after he went through that whole, it, there's there's a common thing we see among all these uh, types of people. They all have a pedigree that includes a big stop in the British government, at the top of the British government. And then right after or right as they're becoming a minister, uh, they become a knight. Uh, they're invited to the Privy Council. Uh, in, in, in Lord Moloch's case, he, was a, he became a baron or a lord. And uh, so he has every title you can possibly imagine. And therefore, he's connected with whatever is going on in the Privy, Privy Council. He's right there at the center of it. And then he goes into private practice. And then that's where the raping and, raping and pillaging occurs. Because you've got, um, in his case, he admits to uh, being a director or chairman or, or uh, advisor or trustee or... Um, uh, head potentate of probably 15 to 20 corporations heavily involved in oil and gas, heavily involved in Africa, uh, all working World Bank connections, of uh, insurance connections, um, and the like. And in the end, he is involved with Probably, we, we haven't added it up yet, but I'm going to guess it's 1,000 to 1,500 key names of people who are leaders in, in these various companies all around the planet. And he is to this day. And, and inside those organizations, we see relationships with just about every corporation and bank and insurance company and government agency on the planet. 
including many of his NGOs, which he's involved in, that, that do include American uh, business leaders, politicians, uh, bankers. So you see this just unbelievable collection of people that we now can easily associate with the deep state shadow government. And these are all under this umbrella of this man named Lord Mark Malik Brown. And we have struggled with, who is this guy? What? How does he relate to the queen? It, it appears that he directs the queen. It appears that he is taking orders from a global world government group where he is their chief uh, banker. He is their chief financier. He is their chief uh, fundraiser. And he's in all the right places at all the right times all over the planet to this very day. He's 63 years old right now. So he is very much in his prime and he's on the move. Invest Tech. Um, let's see. It basically is a company that controls hundreds of other companies, and he controls it, and I've never even seen anything like 365 this. 365 companies. It is beyond anything I have ever seen. How can there be a company that controls 365 other large companies and be ruled from a place where there are no laws that where he has to reveal his conflict of interest with well, any that's, of these. Well, that's a good point. In America, it, had an executive been involved in these various companies, they would be required by ethics law to not only name the company that was the conflict, but all of the key personnel w that were either officers, directors, or 5% shareholders or, or greater. That's a requirement of our ethics laws. So our ethics laws are a little bit more transparent. In Sir Mark, I mean uh, Lord Mark Malik Brown's world, he doesn't even have to hardly mention them, and he certainly doesn't have to mention the principles inside these organizations. And then you you mentioned Invest Tech. One of the things that we talked about earlier was the fact that in many of those Invest Tech investments, there are investors in nominee accounts which are basically hidden offshore accounts where the true investors are hidden. And there are, I'm going to just say, 50 to 100 of those nominee accounts in what we've seen in the, in the research that's been done over the last month. So inside those, my guess is you're going to see all the names that, that want to hide themselves on the planet. You're going to see judges in the U.S. You're going to see key politicians. Why? Because their investments are hidden and they're, they're protected by the Queen's Privy Council. Because in case these guys get in trouble, they go to the, a special court called the Queen's Court, which you talk about a rigged system in the U.S. It's doubly rigged there because they, they protect the Queen. So anything the Queen wants protected will be buried. So the old British East India Company that then became basically the Queen's Privy Council is essentially was gearing up to become the rulers of the globalists who are going to rule out of the United Nations because we see that Lord Malik, I like to call him Malik because that's an evil uh, Sumerian uh, god of mammon, god of money, and he seems to me like the worst of globalists that I've ever seen. He actually has organizations which are incomprehensible, to be quite frank with you. What you were just describing, when you see the lists and you realize how big these companies are, he can't possibly have any interaction with them except to give all of them at one moment orders from the top, and they all must obey. That could be the only way that he could possibly manage all of these companies. Plus, he was the second in charge of refugees, and refugees is the business of the United Nations that makes them most of their money. And then the other things that make money, he was the head of that, World Bank. He was part of the World Trade Organization and all these other ones, the WEF, the IMF, all of them. And he knows how to skim the money. So he has a company I'd like for you to tell them about where he has taught Bill and Hillary how to insert themselves as a toll booth to receive money for countries that have emergencies and they pocket most of it. He has an entire 
group of those companies that do that all over the world. So he is probably like Hillary and Bill, right there helping create the chaos so that they can then profit massively by supposed charities that are philanthropically helping areas that have come under emergency. So I think that he is teaching people like Bill and Hillary and, and now the Obamas and the Bushes before them, how it is to basically put a tax or a toll that has to go to the top with absolute impunity that cannot be prosecuted. It cannot even be questioned. As a matter of fact, it can't even be conceived. And that's what I'm describing. It can't even be conceived that this is actually in place. And these are institutions that are as old as anything. Right. Anyone no, remembers. no reasonable person would believe that, that, uh, that people that they put their trust in to, uh, to run their public institution could be acting in such a profligate way. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, foundation you're talking about, but let me talk about one, and that's the Shell Foundation. Oh, yes. uh, in, in, uh, <laughs> in his UK Parliament uh, um, bio, he mentions the Shell Foundation. So our researchers dug into the Shell Foundation and discovered it has a British version, it has an American version, and it has a Dutch version. And, and it's, it's related to Dutch Royal Shell. Uh, but the British version, uh, Lord Malik, uh has been a director, and it is ostensibly a charity. It was formed in England as a charity to, uh, to fund um, projects in Africa. And there again gets back to your refugee issue. Uh, these guys are quite fascinated with Africa. And, and uh, on the one hand, he's got many holdings in Swiss uh, mining companies, in oil companies, in reinsurance companies that all go down to, to uh, Africa. And uh, amazingly, they all get involved with energy and oil and, and things like this to control the wealth that's coming out of Africa, obviously. But in the Shell Company, Shell Foundation, they talk about a lot of charitable activities that they're involved in. And then in one of their, one of their annual reports, they very briefly describe a, um, a holding they have, and I can't remember the exact, the exact name, but it's Shell Management Something Limited. And we looked at that, and lo and behold, that company was funded with $2 million from OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corp, started by Congress, which is a ostensibly a public agency in the U.S. But we put money in Shell Foundation, which then turned around and created a private organization, private uh, investment management company headquartered in London that operated as a private organization. Now, how wrong is that? That's what I'm talking about, using charities and the illusion of philanthropy to actually take money from America and other countries that are trying to help people who are in need, and they simply shift it into other companies that steal it. It's just disturbing. Now tell I'm, us- I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake. It's not OPIC, it was USAID. Yes, yeah, it, I well, had we had remember. mentioned before, he gets money from USAID. USAID was the organization that he, we put, USAID money into a British charity, which then invested and made their own private corporation solely with that funding that uh, then operated on its own. And we have yet to cross-reference the OPIC uh, recipients of these grants that we have made available to you in our intelligence reports and on Truth News headlines and through research through Americans for Innovation. And if you actually cross-reference those, we haven't cross-referenced those with the hundreds and hundreds of Lord Malik's companies. So as far as we know, he could be literally, literally be receiving huge amounts of this to companies that go straight to him, which are nothing but companies to receive money stolen from America. Well, if you, if you, if, if you just think about it, that situation had to have been so obvious that the auditor, which was Ernst & Young on that particular report, couldn't hide the fact that USAID had provided this cash and actually disclosed it. So that's they actually described. Just think about all the other investments that they've hidden. Now, this implies human trafficking. 
And uh, recently, uh, Cheryl Mills was found out because of her Black Ivy group, which is supposed to fly under the flag of being an energy group, is actually human trafficking in, South, in Africa and many countries. And she was personally responsible for helping Hillary spend $55 billion through USAID. And it went to some of her companies. And it went to some companies that, of course, were involved with Sir Jeffrey Patty. And we've demonstrated that by following it back to some of the companies that receive these guaranteed loans, which then they uh, simply receive the money, default, don't build what they say they're going to build, pocket the money. And there is no reporting involved whatsoever. And this has now come out again in the news that there's no reporting involved in OPEC uh, supported uh, loans and in USAID. It is it is so thin. Well, the they, they actually disclosed to one FOIA uh, uh, requester that uh, they destroyed the records. So they don't have the accountability records on some reinsurance projects that they did. We were laughing the other day because we had found that they had spent hundreds and thousands of dollars to build a Marriott in Afghanistan. And we said, what are they going to use it for a target practice? Well, guess what happened? It never got completed and they use it for target practice. <laughs> It doesn't that's, take that's a genius sad. to figure out the rat lines of evil, folks. So that's the reason we are oftentimes accurate about our predictions, because it's real easy to see Wait this Wait a now. second, Douglas. They have beautiful websites that have pictures of all these happy people, <laughs> and they, have all, they show all these completed projects for water and agriculture and building, and if it's on the Internet, you can believe it. If you go to the Clinton Foundation and you look up what... I'm going to give you is the name that should put Bill Clinton in jail immediately, and that's the Clinton Justra Sustainability Growth Fund, which is the two hundred million he got for the Uranium One deal, and then fifty percent of Gold Corps for the rest of their life from Frank Justra and a hundred million from Carlos Slim. Add that one up. And what are you gonna see? Because of the subliminal programming on the page, it will make you cry. <laughs> what they did with that lovely money. I'm so happy that they received. <laughs> Let's count that up. Okay, 200, okay. 300. Before I forget it. That was 400 that year. So that year he got $400 million for one deal, which he you can describe the exact details because you know, you've know you seen the picture, you've seen the date when Bill Clinton went to Kazakhstan and got himself that little Kazakhstan empty uranium mine, which then became... Uh, the the target uh, the, the thing that became, ma- uh, ballooned into uranium one which don't even get me started on he got three point two billion dollars for selling that company two years later oh there you go I'm so, so glad was... you remembered the exact but amount before I, didn't I forget want to it, exaggerate before I forget it on on you mentioned Frank Justra uh, in the Lord Malik Brown uh, study one of the uh, groups that he was the chairman of or I think still is the chairman of, is the International Crisis Group. It's quite a large That's group. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, among the um, uh, members of the International Crisis Group is none other than Frank Justra. Okay. Now. Before- and Larry Summers and Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook. All the usual suspects. And even others. Yes, there are others. I don't recall them right now. Americans that you'll be shocked to see that these Americans have sold out to the Brits and are hiding underneath their system of global corporate protection from the Privy Council so that they don't have to pay taxes and that they can, in fact, become enemies of our nation because these people are enemies of ours. Now, I'm going to, before we get to the election rigging and the machines and uh, Lord Malik and that, I'm going to now go to the secret piece that we knew had to exist, and we got to thank James again, because he, out of the blue, pulls this name that we're going, who's that? Well, we better look at that, and it answers our question. We said, George Soros must be connected to the Privy Council. Please explain to them how George Soros is connected to the Privy Council, Michael. Mm. Uh, Yeah, Lord Malik Brown, Lord Mark Malik Brown, uh, doesn't even hide his relationship to George Soros. Uh, you see many videos of them making presentations together. Uh, but uh, in, the, in uh, Malik Brown's career, before he joined the UK Parliament, he uh, was a director of Quantum Fund and was a founding director, I believe, of 
Open Society Foundation. The original so, chairman. Original chairman, yes. Uh, all, obviously, George Soros uh, entities. So he doesn't even, he, he doesn't even hide his association. And, and therefore, and George has continually been involved in everything he's done. And in fact, when he lived in, in the U.S. and worked at the U.N., he lived on a George Soros estate and paid, I think, $15,000 a month for staying in that little pad. So there you have it. The European Union of George Soros has its fingers in the Privy Council, which means that when they almost brought the Bank of England to its feet and brought the U- the British pound almost to its uh, bankruptcy. According to them. You had said George Soros must be connected to the Privy Council because the Bank of England wouldn't have let that happen unless they were part of it and somebody right. got a payoff. There it is, folks. And we found that George Soros and the manipulation of elections... But that, By the way, that was in 92, right before Bill Clinton. That was right before Bill Clinton was elected president and right before all of the activities to centralize the Internet of Things started in the U.S. Because they understood that your invention of social networking would make it that they would drive everything to digital centralization so that they could have global control. And that you have found both with Jeffrey Patty and his control of intelligence and information systems and also with Lord Malik and his control of many companies that are in some way uh, not the so the militarized one like Jeffrey Patty handles all this terrible militarization uh, atomic weapons the sneaking into our largest indu- military industrial contractors in other words Britain gets most of our military money does anybody know that does anybody know that Lockheed Martin and, is controlled by Serco and, and the Lockheed Martin actually runs the uh, AWE, the uh, Atomic Weapons Establishment in the UK. And then Serco runs them. Yes. And so the Queen's Golden Share runs probably, uh, let me just say, uh, I will say uh, four of the top seven military industrial contractors in America are run by the Queen's Golden Shares and Jeffrey Patty. And so he handles that end. And then Lord Malik seems to handle everything else. George... So Patty handles influence through manipulation, through strategic communications laboratories. Through Serco, he controls the web that enters into all of the Commonwealth nations. And we are basically a subsidiary of Britain. We are still a Commonwealth nation. We just don't know it. And uh, then you have Lord Malik, who basically picks up all other pieces and turns them into globalism. So he's kind of... He's the influence peddler for globalism. And he's like the... A mafia, uh, Don, who they all have to ask, well, is it going to be okay with you in the future? And he has to say, well, in our globalist plans, uh, no, you don't exist. So I'm going to change your company name to this, and then we're going to change it over here, and then we're going to hide it in Venezuela, and then we're going to... whatever. It doesn't matter. This man acts with impunity as the worst corporate terrorist on the face of the earth and the worst globalist. So he and George Soros sleep in the same bed and they tell the Privy Council what to do. You have discovered this, in my opinion. No, it was Betsy that said it. Thank you very much, Betsy. Betsy directs us always. We know that. Who's protecting George Soros? And it has to be, in the end, the Queen. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. But then you guys... Had to prove it. That was true, yeah. Yeah, you you intuit it and then we have to prove it. Which takes uh, Gee, thanks, 587 miners have been down in the dark for three weeks for you. I hope you're satisfied. So we want to thank you. But we had yes. to do a lot of work. And then I know you're happy because of my uh, ridiculousness when I said, I hope the queen trips and her purse opens and we finally get to realize what's in it. And what will be in it, Betsy? The golden shares! And yeah. they'll dump out on the ground. And Trump will pick up one of them and go... I got a couple of these and hand it to her and not be interested because really she's daft and they tried to accuse her, him of cutting her off. Well, America first. We don't bow to monarchs no matter what country they're in because we're not Barack Obama who bows to every master who comes in his presence, which he did. Well, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the troubling uh, 
contemporary issues related to Lord Malik Brown is his uh, influence over the voting machines. And this is something that we've got to pay attention to now. We can't leave this when we can't procrastinate anymore because if they're able to use this uh, international networking uh, among these machines, it's possible that they could swing the U.S. election in, uh, uh, in ways that are, are not going to reflect the vote. Wait, you've already proven the Diebold machines in Ohio did create false election results. You've yes. already proven the man in the middle in Carl Rove. Well, we didn't see, we didn't see uh, Lord Malik Brown at that time. Yeah, but he was he knew about Optech, which is the software in all of them. And so that is the great revelation, yes. is that Optech was created in Venezuela by Jimmy Carter. And why, here, here's the issue. I always wondered, why Venezuela? Well, that's because at the time of the elections of uh, Chavez, Lord Malik Brown was working at the UN, and he was assigned to advise those countries on their elections. And that's how he got involved in Venezuela. And in the process, they hired a couple of Venezuela technologists who then worked on that Optech software with other people. There were some Americans involved too. But in the end, the, all that software made its way into the Smartmatic machines. And then you see, and, and this is what uh, James uh, was um, puzzled by because you saw then flips and turns and double flips and mergers and, and bankruptcies and, and renaming of corporations, previous names that had been sent out of business. And you saw then buyouts and then you saw the Department of Justice issue orders so that Mitt Romney's company could buy into the uh, software for one of the companies that then had the Optech software inside of it. So in the end, one of the things we asked James is, James, what's the common thread here? And that's when James figured out it was the Optech engine is in all of these electronic machines that are used in our elections. That's why they're, they're pushing electronics so hard. So we've said, what is a simple solution to the fact that they obviously are controlling our machines? How do we prevent uh, an, unfair, an unfair vote? And uh, frankly, all I'm interested in is a fair vote. I don't care who's elected. I want the vote to be fair. So um, let me recap. Lord Malik, the evil one, goes from one office to the next for one year. He fixes it for the Privy Council globalists and then moves on to the next. And one at one point, he was basically in charge of all of the UN oversight of elections throughout the whole world. And at that time, he made sure that Jimmy Carter, who was funded by BCCI, a well-known Pakistani bank that is a front for the CIA, the Pakistani ISI, Israeli Mossad and others, that is who funded him. When that came out, of course, that was then obliterated uh, from the news. And of course, when uh, someone more evil from the CIA came along, George H.W. Bush, then the October surprise got rid of Jimmy. But Jimmy had a group called the International, correct me on this, International Elections Systems, or I think there's another word in it. it but anyway, he created this foundation in Venezuela with the CIA to create a software that could be used in any machine thereafter to rig any election in any country anywhere. This is how CIA does it. Folks, I'm sorry. I had to red pill you on Jimmy Carter. He wasn't just a peanut farmer. He was CIA through and through, and that's the reason to this very day when he stands with those other presidents against Trump. Do not for one second think that he was an innocent person. He's as evil as any president just about, but George H.W. Bush probably takes, you know, takes the cake. But the others have been striving, striving to be like Daddy Bush and be a really good CIA agent. So we are talking about the rogue CIA because every president, after they get out of the White House, creates their own version of the rogue CIA, their own intelligence agency, and they get their own enrichment. So Jimmy Carter has to this very moment, folks, though he stands up and made horrible statements against Trump and made stupid statements about how he believes in elections. And and he is one of the people who goes over to make sure elections are right. And if this group and other groups say that as they get 
exit polls, if the exit polls don't meet their numbers, they say that in any country in the world, it wasn't a democratic election, and they say it's null and void. They control elections from perception management from the beginning through Jeffrey uh, Patty and uh, Strategic Communications Laboratories and other groups like them. They control it through the politics by corrupt election funds, and then they control it through the machines. And when they say, oh, Diebold was bad. Yeah, Diebold, we know it was fractional voting. We've proven it a thousand times. We'll get rid of Diebold. We'll go to Sequoia. We'll go to uh, ES&S. Right. We'll go. It's all, all the, the same all software. All the options are rigged. Every the, option is rigged. And as you say, right. the only way out of this digital prison is paper and to ink your finger if you'd right. actually like people right. who voting who, who should vote. And then you ask a citizen, fellow citizens in the precinct, bipartisan, all represented, sit there and count the votes themselves, and then that's the vote that's carried to the state election board so that you have an unbroken chain of custody. And that is what software machines can never give you. Ask any technology guy worth his salt that's not lying to you. And they will tell you there's no way that you can verify that the votes being printed out on that machine are the same as the votes in the in the cards unless you count the cards also. Because you don't know what's going on in that software. It could be flipping those votes upside down and backwards for all you know. You don't know. Now we've characterized evil Lord Moloch and... To reiterate, 17 states in the United States of America, Commonwealth of British, I, I'm sorry, Commonwealth of the United, I mean, uh, sorry, the United States of America that never really got their independence from Britain has 17 rigged states They're that have Smartmatic correct. machines in them. They are effing rigged. Mr. President, your stupid Department of Homeland Security director just stated that she's just checked into every aspect and met with all the Secretary of States and looked at all the voting machines and says there is absolutely no way that anybody can possibly affect our elections this time. There's but no... Wait, wait, Douglas. No hint at Russian meddling. No nothing. Oh, wait a second. But a federal bureau, third-party federal, federal bureau has sent you a letter at the state election bureau in your state and said these machines are verified to be working properly. So why do you have a problem with using those machines then in your local precinct? Why do you have a problem with that? Oh, because they told you the it government was said it was okay. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I must yes. be making mistakes. That's, the government does not. That's make an mistakes. unbroken chain of custody in their view. I mean, how ridiculous is this? They use Facebook now, and they want to have this, the Secretary oh, yeah. of State's the report state through of Facebook. Washington. And they want, and they think that Facebook, after all we found out about Facebook, that that is a viable option, folks. If it's digital, it's a lie. Yes, the state, and believe that, the state of Washington is now going to use Facebook to collect votes. When we know that dude Zuckerberg didn't create so. And he lied about everything in his testimony. He's no, right now, Google and Facebook are facing billion-dollar fines in Europe and in Australia. Why aren't we fining them? They did the same thing here. Why aren't we fining them? Well, in the end, according to the Constitution, the vote is the property of the people. It's not a government responsibility to protect its vote. It's the people's responsibility. So unless we, the people take over our vote, we deserve the result. To prove we're not exaggerating, Hillary Clinton went in with Jill Stein for a recount. When they got to the third state and they got to Detroit, they found that the vote was so pathetically rigged that they stopped their recount. Then, after Trump got in power, he asked Pence, Mike Pence to please head up a Federal Elections Commission a voluntary assessment of the authenticity of the vote. Only seven states responded that they then calculated and they found between 2.5 to 3.5 million illegal votes simply by checking licenses against their lists. They found so many people dead that voted and so many people 
with uh, IDs that voted that are not naturalized, that are not citizens, that the Democrats insisted that it was like a Ru- uh, the Russians were, they actually insinuated and said Michael Pence was being driven by the Russians to demonstrate that, uh, that the vote was not true when the vote was true. And then at that point they said, no, remember what Obama said, not one single vote was changed. Remember what Clapper said. After all the investigations, not one single vote was affected by the Russian meddling. What did Brennan say? Not one single vote was affected. What did Comey? They all said the same thing. I don't care what they say. They aren't we the people. We the people have got to take over the conduct and the management of our vote. It's not even the Secretary of State's, in the Secretary of State's power in a state to run the election. It is the people's power. The people have got to take back the power in this particular important area. And it's got to be bipartisan. It's got to be fair. And that's all I care about is a fair vote. I don't care whether my candidate gets in or not. If the vote was fair, then I'll I'll accept the result. But in these cases, we can't accept the result in any of these states right now. Correct. So, to summarize, I warned you to sit down. If you haven't passed out by now, then you're asking the question, what can we do about this? Well, what we did about it is research, and then we put it out there, and now it's reached 60 million people that we know of, at least at least 60 million people in the world now know that there is no such thing as an electronically sound vote in America. Get rid of op tech. Get rid of the software. Quit playing the games with Lord Malik. Quit playing the games with Jeffrey Patty. Last year, last election, 2016, he went down, and Strategic Communications Laboratories and the Queen's Privy Council and Jeffrey Patty went down, and they had to now reconstitute and, and, and start in their other companies. We need to take down Lord Malik and his globalism and his globalism control of the software and some of the hardware, Smartmatic election machines that are in 17 U.S. states for the next election. We have to right now call foul. We have to put a moratorium on any electronic digital election results. They must be paper. They must be able to be recounted. We don't care how long it takes for them to get turned in. We want them accurate, and we only want people who have verified I-9s, which is you have to fill out an I-9 when you work for practically anyone that states that you're a citizen. And if you can't provide that information, you don't get to vote, and then you're going to get your thumb inked so you don't get to vote 10 times in a row. And then Lord Moloch will be on the run. And that's what we wanted to do today. Tell you how easy it is to take the most evil person we have ever found and wipe him out simply by bringing him to light.